Hello, my name is Stephanie Berlin. I'm a nurse practitioner here at the KSB Center for Wound Healing. I have a Master of Science degree uh, in nursing through Chamberlain College. I'm board certified as a family nurse practitioner through the American Nurses Credentialing Center. And I'm wound care certified through the National Alliance of Wound Care and Ostomy. I have been a part of the KSB family for 16 and a half years and transitioned to the Wound Care Center since 2021. Throughout my years, I've gained experience in the treatment of acute and chronic wounds. This area of specialty is fairly complex and can be difficult for the average person or experienced provider without the right support, tools, and education. This is why today I would like to discuss the most common mistakes made in wound management. Wounds can be difficult to heal until specializing in wound care. I also made many of the mistakes that we will talk about today. I plan on providing education on moist wound healing, antimicrobial stewardship, symptom awareness and ownership, the art of dressing choice, patient-centered care, risk factors and underlying medical conditions contributing to delayed wound healing, wound types, and of course, the services provided in our skilled wound care center. Hopefully this presentation will shed some light on the complexities of wound healing and the value of skilled care here at KSB. So to start off, one of the most common mistakes I see in wound care is the use of dry wound healing. Dry wound healing can range from leaving a wound open to air without addressing or application of drying agents such as betadine, alcohol, or astringents. We can think of this simply by looking at the picture of the desert here. As you can see, life has a hard time surviving in this environment. This applies to your living skin as well. The cells in our body are in a moist environment. It's the way they do their job. When a wound is left to be too dry, our cells have difficulty performing normal tasks, such as repairing a wound. This can, this can lead to delayed closure and invasion of bacteria or other microorganisms into the wound bed. Bacteria and other microorganisms do not need a moist environment to function. When dry wound healing is used, these organisms are able to easily move into the wound bed. Thus, an infection or complication can occur. This method not only delays wound healing, but increases the risk of infection. There's currently only one indication for this method of wound healing, and that is for wounds with poor blood supply known as ischemic ulcers. The thought here is that we focus on returning the blood flow before proceeding with moist wound healing. The goal is to always transition to moist wound healing in order to heal the wound in as little time as possible and prevent complications. Moist wound healing has been shown to be the most effective method of healing. Moist environments support life. Here are a few examples such as oceans, prairies, and forests. Living things are able to thrive in these environments such as the body cells are able to thrive in a moist wound bed. They're able to perform their normal duties and respond to invading microorganisms. I don't want anyone to get the wrong idea. When I say moist wound healing, uh, we mean moisture balance. Obviously too much moisture can lead to the breakdown of healthy skin, also known as maceration, leading to increased pain and likely increased wound size. Too much moisture can often be mistaken for wound infection, which we'll get into later. With that in mind, moist wound healing has been shown to decrease the risk for infection, accelerate wound healing, and supports the normal functions of the skin. We are decreasing infection risk by providing a normal environment that supports normal cellular and skin functions. Skin functions include protection. The skin is the first line of defense against external elements and prevents water loss. Immunity, protection against invading microorganisms. Thermoregulation, temperature maintenance. Uh, many people don't know that if a wound is left open, the temperature can drop and not return to normal for up to four hours later. This is why we try to avoid dry wound healing prolonged wait times with dressing changes, or changing the dressing frequently. If the wound is becoming too moist, it is ideal to change the dressing to something that can absorb more moisture versus more frequent dressing changes. Sensation, 
detecting pain, touch, temperature, itching, and pressure, metabolism, responsible for keeping calcium and phosphorus levels in the bones and blood, and communication. The condition and appearance of our skin can affect our self-image and socialization with others. An article written by Osama Osman in 2010 discusses this concept and how we as humans communicate how we are internally by using our external features. Many of us dress a certain way or have cosmetic surgeries in order to communicate how we perceive ourselves. It is extremely common for people with wounds or dermatologic conditions to have difficulty psychologically with communication. The next most common mistake made in wound healing is the overuse of antibiotics. It is extremely common for patients to have multiple rounds of a systemic antibiotic therapy prior to skilled wound care referral. I find that it is often assumed that because a wound is not healing, that it must be due to an underlying infection, despite the signs and symptoms being absent. Keep in mind that failure to treat an infection can result in complications such as systemic illness, such as sepsis, bloodstream infections, or bone infections. Signs and symptoms of wound infection include redness surrounding the wound, increased pain, local fever or increased warmth, abnormal drainage, or odor. These symptoms can be present if there isn't an infection as well. Erythema or redness can also be caused by too much moisture or tape allergies can also mimic redness. Increased pain can be caused from angiogenesis, which is actually a good sign that happens as the damaged nerves at the site are regenerating. Increased warmth surrounding the wound can be associated with uh, the location, most commonly areas that are covered in clothing or are in warm, dark places can be mistaken as a sign of infection. Abnormal drainage. Certain dressings can appear as abnormal color. And odor. Uh, the correct way to evaluate odor is to evaluate it after cleansing the wound. Antimicrobial stewardship in healthcare is a common topic to prevent the overuse of antimicrobials. These antimicrobials include systemic, impregnated dressings, or topical. Some tactics we use in wound care are changing the dressing or treatment about every four weeks. This can decrease the risk of bacterial resistance. We also perform weekly sharp surgical debridement to remove biofilm, which can often be resistant to antimicrobial therapy due to a protective coating. According to Franzo 2022, bacteria including MRSA can be managed without antimicrobials. This study showed the efficacy of sharp surgical debridement and dressings absent of antimicrobial contents. We perform cultures prior to prescribing antimicrobial therapy. The purpose of wound culture is to target the antimicrobial therapy to the offending organism. For chronic wounds, a surface culture is sometimes not enough and cannot pick up the bacteria and biofilm. In these cases, a tissue culture is preferred. When a wound has to symptoms of infection, it is best to pair antibiotic therapy with sharp surgical debridement to target removal of biofilm, topical antimicrobial dressings, and good control of underlying health problems contributing to impaired wound healing. The average person can become complacent when choosing a dressing. We often go off of what we've always known, what's most available, and what's cost-effective. Most people, including providers, are unaware of what dressings are out there and appropriate. Where do you start when choosing a dressing or treatment? Wound care providers base their dressing choice off a variety of factors, including evidence. Many dressings have been shown to be effective in treating certain wound types. Wound characteristics. Do we need to control versus donate moisture? Is there pain? Is there swelling? Would they be appropriate for a compression dressing? Is there an underlying infection or risk for infection? Is there a large amount of dead tissue, such as slough or eschar? Cost. Cost is a huge factor. Did you know in skilled wound care, products are shipped directly to the patient if they are performing their own dressing changes at home? If advanced skin sub substitutes or grafts are used, these are run through insurance for approval prior to application. 
In a study performed by Rivolo and Staines in 21, cost effectiveness was evaluated in specialist wound care services on lower leg wounds. This study supported care delivered by an evidence-based trained team with better healing rates and cost savings. Ease of use. Multiple products at once can be confusing. Keeping the treatment simple with as few products as possible and as little dressing changes as possible is goal. Another common mistake made in wound care is poor symptom awareness and ownership. Part of skilled wound care is providing education in order, to, in order for the patient to become more active participant in the care of their wound. According to Bethel et al. in 2006, the purpose of this process is to empower the patient to make an informed decision when it, becomes, when it comes to management of their wound. This may vary depending on the impact the wound has on a patient's life. In this process, it can take many discussions or visits to set realistic expectations and understanding treatment options. By being a more active participant, patients have symptom awareness, which can make a huge difference in wound healing. Here to make treatment patient-centered and wound care can impair healing. We evaluate support at home. This can be physical or emotional. Some wounds are difficult to dress on your own and evaluating how much help a person needs is important. Having a wound, whether acute or chronic, can take a toll emotionally. Patients often feel helpless and as if they have tried everything prior to entering skilled wound care. With new tools, support, and education, this can improve. Economic factors or resources, uh, important conversation to have. We don't want to cause a heavy financial burden to the patient in order to have wound healing. Responsibilities, evaluating current employment, schedule, or childcare. Health literacy, this refers to the patient's understanding of healthcare and can be the basis for education. Access to healthcare, does the patient drive? Do they need assistance making it to appointments? This is a common cause of missed appointments. We have helped many patients in these situations with finding transportation, whether it is public or approved through insurance. Mobility and activity. How active is the patient? Is inactivity contributing to the development of the wound? Would they benefit from therapy or assistance at home? Coping and acceptance. Factor into ownership and active participation in care. We focus on getting the patient the support they need to enhance this. Values and beliefs. We have a variety of products in the wound care center, including animal products. Of course, education on products being considered for treatment is so that the patient can make an informed decision that is in line with their beliefs and values. Dietary preferences and restrictions should be considered in order to make appropriate recommendations and nutritional goals and wound healing. Pain management, every patient's pain is individual with preferences on non-pharmacologic versus pharmacologic management. Environment, what are current living conditions like? Does the patient need assistance with cooking or cleaning? Another common mistake is the failure to identify risk factors or medical conditions related to wound healing. Some risk factors I have here are obesity, hygiene practices, advanced age, allergies, occupational hazards, and drugs. Some medical conditions include diabetes, venous insufficiency, cancer, incontinence, uh, which refers to the inability to control bowel or bladder function, chronic kidney disease, gout, and conditions causing decreased circulating oxygen. Identifying the wound type is essential in order to effectively treat a wound. Failure to identify the cause can delay wound healing. There are many different types of wounds. The most common include venous, arterial, diabetic, pressure, moisture associated, surgical, tears, bites, burns, radiation injury, and skin cancer ulcerations. Here are some of the more atypical types of wounds, uh, which include pyoderma, Kaposi sarcoma, herpes zoster, sickle cell ulcers, necrotizing fasciitis, calciphylaxis, pemphigus, and fistulas. 
Finally, another common mistake is delaying skilled wound care. I cannot stress enough the value of services we provide here at KSB Center for Wound Healing. We have partnered with a company called Restorix, which has an excellent team with extensive experience and resources. We measure our success by keeping track of healing rates, which have been exceeding our benchmark of greater than 90%. The benchmark for days to heal is set at 32, and currently we have an average of 14 days total. Our center recently won the Clinical Distinction, Distinction and Patient Satisfaction Award. Our standards of care here in the Wound Care Center are to evaluate blood flow in order to ensure that there is good oxygen supply to the wound bed and enhance healing, treat infection that is identified on exam with imaging, culture guided, and paired with systemic antimicrobial therapy and topical antimicrobial therapy. We are skilled at identifying complications such as bone infections. With frequent visits and empowering the patient, we can identify complications early and reduce hospitalization rates. Debridement. This is typically performed weekly. As discussed earlier, debridement is effective in removing not only dead skin cells, but also bacteria and biofilm, which is often hard to treat in chronic wounds. Glucose control and nutrition. We screen patients for diabetes and nutritional deficiencies related to wound healing. We work with our dietitians and primary care providers to get patients the support they need to be successful in blood sugar management. We encourage increased protein intake for wound healing and tailor our recommendations based on the patient's dietary needs. Offloading. We encourage offloading depending on the wound type. Offloading refers to keeping weight off of the wound in order to increase the oxygen supply to the wound bed. This is common treatment in diabetic foot ulcers and pressure ulcers. There are a variety of offloading devices available that are recommended for use based on wound type and location. Host factors refers to risk factors and underlying health problems as discussed previously. Failure to acknowledge <clears throat> Failure to acknowledge and tackle these problems can be problematic. The next topic we're gonna to talk about is adjunctive interventions or additional services we provide are advanced modalities with skin substitutes and grafts. Various products are available made from either animal, such as uh, cow, pig, or fish products, human uh, or placental products, approved for non-healing chronic wounds based on the type that support the normal healing process. These products are applied after sharp debridement by a wound care provider and stay in place for typically one week. Negative pressure wound therapy or wound vac. This device, as you can see here in the picture, um, is hooked up to suction or negative pressure to manage moisture in the wound bed and accelerate healing. This is also applied by a trained provider or nurse and changed about two to three times weekly, depending on location. This is typically applied to deeper wounds. And finally, the hyperbaric oxygen chamber. We currently have two of these in the wound care center. Uh, these are approved for use uh, for certain wound types. The concept here is that you are receiving a higher amount of oxygen to accelerate healing. I hope after listening to my presentation today that you take away the complexities of what we do here and don't hesitate to reach out for help if you need it. We are available with or without referral. Thank you.